uh, you learn what it's about. So from there, what happened is I go to Bruce's studio. So I enter Bruce's studio. Oh my God. So Bruce loved his toys. And Bruce had a Pro Tools system today owned by Avid, which was eventually bought by Apple. Mm. And Pro Tools still today is an industry standard. Me, did I know those are Pro Tools? In, in fact, at the time, if I'm not wrong, there was only a Pro Tools, I think, in, uh, and how I know, because I wrote to Pro Tools. There was only a Pro Tools <laughs> system, <laughs> I think, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Because it was, it was too good to be true. I couldn't believe it was original. So I learned it was the only system. There was a system in Cairo. Bruce Odiambo was on the website. And like uh, now a few studios in South Africa. No Even way. West Africa at the time were not listed on the Pro Tools website. So they like, because those days, Pro Tools I think was like 10M. Software. Okay. Bruce had it. I told him, now me, eh? I'm not going uh, anywhere. <laughs> I just told him, uh, look. So uh, what, hold on, what were they using at Next Level? There's an, I cannot even remember that okay, software, yeah. but yeah, Sapphire you, City never saw light of, they were maybe morphed into something else. Yeah. So uh, but those days there were hundreds of Oh, smaller um, things. You know, eh? those small ones, and yeah. eventually, mm. one or two. Oh, but for sequencing, there's something called eMagic. Mm. eMagic is what became Logic. Logic was also bought by Apple. Yeah. Which, well. like, yeah, so it's weird. That who knew Steve Jobs uh, was, yeah. So those days, even things like Adobe was not there. In fact, when I joined the music industry, yeah. you and another guy called Bosire were the Logic guys. Yeah. If you have a problem with Logic, call And call I taught Julian. Bosire. <laughs> you FYI, Bosire. I, I, Bosire, yeah, yeah, because I'm there. And do you know how I learned logic? Yeah. I just read the freaking manual. <laughs> it was 800 pages. Dude, yes, but I just started. Good. Everyone else, musicians, would say, How do you record that seat? Yeah. Me, I learned what MIDI was, how MIDI works, I understand how the structure is, I understand how the coding was done. So people would struggle and uh, they would uh, <laughs> uninstall and reinstall. Okay, you know, okay, reset. Okay. Me show guys what to do. And what I always had is, and throughout my career, many doors opened because I was the only guy who knew. Yeah. I would get a job because I can do it. So when I went to Bruce, um, I told him me I want to learn Pro Tools because I know the way the world is going. I think this thing is the way I'm, everything I'm reading, mm. everyone is talking about. It's being used in film, TV, what? So he told me, so what can you do? I told him, yeah, no logic. I know a bit of music programming. He told me, okay, you come. So I sat down. You're uh, still in your teens. Now I'm 20 now. Oh, now you're 20. Now I'm 20 now, okay. yeah. Uh, I'm about 20 now. And so, this is what year? Uh, year 2000. Okay. Year 2000. Uh -huh. So I tell him, um, what I'm going to do is this. You don't have to pay me. I'm good. Fortunately, I didn't live very far. I used to walk. It was mm. like a 30-minute walk, but I could walk to... So uh, this is at current Prestige Plaza. Yes, at Prestige. Uh, yeah, there were some uh, townhouses there. So Bruce had taken up a townhouse and built a studio there. And then Bruce was flat boy. And so it was the first time I saw now the bad boy thing coming. Kajua, so this is a PDD. <laughs> I, need to, I need to know because he had the cars. <laughs> he lived the life. Eh? Uh, then his studio was <laughs> epic. Uh, I mean, the detailing. He had the best of everything. So who if was the producer there at the time? It was just Bruce. There was no one else. There was no one else. Whoa. Uh, you guys used to do everything. Mm. I don't know if there were others before me. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, when I joined, there was no one. It was just him. Okay. Um, but he had a partner called uh, Freddie. Freddie uh, Gitahi. Uh, but Freddie was more of a... He was a producer, but he was doing his own projects. Mm. And he was a business partner. He was more of an owner. So the two of them are my bosses. Okay. But Bruce was really the operational guy. So, but FYI, I've never heard of Bruce in my life. Eh? I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about Safari Sound. I know nothing about Bruce. The only memory I know, I've seen him with Guido. Having yeah. a drink. Go, going, going, for, going, going for Mira. Going for Mira. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So he takes me to his studio. His first studio entered with dual monitors. I mean, you have to understand, Bruce was extra. Eh? He had a microphone, a very rare microphone, the only one in Kenya. That microphone was worth a million at the time, $10,000 or so. A German, this, it was even more superior. It was called a Sound Deluxe. I don't even know if the company is still there. And it was gold plated. The, the, mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. mic, eh? you'd be here, someone is there, you just say, what's up, you can hear. <laughs> so it was the first time I saw all this high-grade uh, tech and stuff. So he tells me, you know logic? I tell him I know logic. So he opens for me logic, show me what you can do. Before I start, I reconfigure. Tell him you're wasting your logic, let me show you. I start doing for him things. He was there like, eh? I told him, yeah, you don't need to do this. Do you know you can record vocals? Do you know you can record Nini? In a week, he tells me, yo, I want to hire you. What? I'm saying, really? He said, yeah, and I'll pay you. What? Me? And I know I've been paid. So that was my first job. So I'm being paid uh, 5,000 bob. 
Now, let, just put into perspective, my monthly budget at the time, because I was still living at home, I don't think I needed more than 300 shillings. <laughs> uh, 300 <laughs> could do, I mean, just to put in context, uh, cheap quarter was maybe 90 bob, 95. Yeah. So just maybe you can extrapolate yeah, yeah. to this rate. But that was a lot of money. A lot of money. Five Gs. And then I'm in a playhouse. Now that's where now I really, really experiment. Now because Bruce was quite the hustler and all over the place, when he's not around, Nani, Mimi, start sequencing, doing. So now I was born twice now. Uh, Timo is at Samawati. He's got a job there. He had the musical skills, so he mm -hmm. got a job quickly. Uh, so we are doing a similar role. Basically, the resident um, producer, engineer. So he's at Samati, I'm at Johari. So you can imagine what's happening to, our, gai, 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 to both gai, of us. Gai, 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 gai. It's insane. We are learning the chops. We're comparing notes, share, hang, hanging out all the time. We can, we meet. So even now, what we're doing in church is not a child's play anymore. Now we are doing, I would say we are doing serious work. And we are really exploring what to do. So there I was tell no him, studio in Eastern Africa, yeah. which was like the studio that you're in. I was in the best studio in East Africa. And then uh, at the time, the only place there was some action. Lucas is starting to expose. So Ted Josiah is on uh, Audio Vault, has taken off. Mm -hmm. um, it's doing some crazy stuff. Then you have um, Lucas is starting now. I think Fruity Loops is emerging. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to hear something. Um, and then there's Keishaka happening on one end. But the big the big bands were now the Zanaziki Masimaira. Those are the people pretty much running. And the live band scene was still huge. Then there was one terrorist called P-Funk. Mm. P-Funk in Tanzania is making beats. We are hearing it's hip hop, it's high quality, but it's also African. Mm. And we are seeing what is this Juma Nature, Professor J. And we are saying, oh my God. What is this sound? So now Kenya has uh, Ted Josiah. They have their P-Funk. But Tanzanians, like the way Diamond is now, at least like 20 tracks a week. Mm -hmm. So it's just abnormal. Mm -hmm. We can't even keep up. Bruce had no interest in music. So the main thing we used to do there is jingles, commercial work. That's why I reinforced my business acumen. Mm -hmm. Bruce was so strict, you'd say, if there's no client in the office, switch off the equipment. And you'd say, every knob has a lifespan. You tell you like this mixer, this fader has 10,000 fades. So every time you move that fade up, money better be coming in <laughs> because it's depreciating. Yeah. So you'd even say, I'd rather you sit and watch TV and play video games than run the studio. Because when you're burning the gear yeah. um, and no one is paying, that's, that was Bruce's mentality. And I started learning how to build. I started learning how to create things. Um, so Bruce gave me a very serious, I saw him negotiate and so, and here's the thing, Bruce was a weird guy. He would pick the guitar, he would play, and I'm saying, Bruce, you play guitar? Yeah, then he chills, he takes the bass, he plays the bass, because he, he played like seven instruments, mm -hmm. but he was never playing music. Bruce was always on calls, talking to ad agencies, negotiating, fighting over payment. And I, used to, I didn't think he was a musician. I didn't even know his heritage and history as an artist. You see now, um, so Bruce was- Again, Bruce, you're in the room of greatness. Yeah, so Bruce is a cold, cold cutted business person. And um, so now I start learning the concept of telling a story in 30 seconds, uh, writing a song in 30 seconds. So now I'm learning how to do this. Mm. And then you're doing for Coke, you're doing for serious brands, Tasker. So you're in the room, marketing manager comes in. Um, and, and you, you can the, see you're the, engineer. you're the engineer and you're nervous and you're wondering, yeah? Then you have celebrity voiceovers, uh, John C. Biokumus, Jimmy Gath has come to do, I'm starstruck. Um, <laughs> You can imagine all this stuff happening, yeah? Um, and then Bruce's house, he just hosted people. Mm. So artists used to come out, hang out on the weekends. So they're just celebrities. Um, I remember I did a track with Red Sun. I did a song with Amani. I did a song with Nameless. All these guys, so all this time, we used to call them Mojambili, yeah? And the reason we call them Mojambili, because all those days when a song starts, Mojambili, like check mic. <laughs> so that's all, that was a generic term. And what Bruce used to do, he would um, he would allow upcoming artists to come. It was his thing. Like, yo, come. So who is the guy? Bruce is not going to sit and do a beat, a hip hop beat. Mm. Say, come, do work with Julian. And I was enjoying it. So I worked, I interacted with a lot of these artists upcoming. Then later blew up and the Logombas, the people who we did something. A lot of songs probably never saw light of day. Mm. But 
it was just fascinating. And for me, uh, those days, the celebrity culture was simpler. You knew everyone. No one was uh, uh, out of reach and what have you. But it was a fun time in terms of that. So for me, at the time, I said I want to do a project. So remember, we had done Virgin. We had done a few songs, but I didn't like the artist life. Uh, going to events. Mm. So we did a few events uh, with Big Ted. You'd go to Huru Park, KCC, sitting backstage, waiting for hours, going on stage. Some days people don't know your song. I couldn't take it. I couldn't handle the limelight or that mm. lifestyle. Mm. And I just said, you know what? Actually, I never wanted this. Me, I'm happy to do that. And those days, uh, Dr. Dre, now we are beginning to learn about him, Timbaland. So I said, oh, there's a whole space for, and actually they seem to be the like people who run the industry, the masterpiece, it's not even the artist, really. When mm. you look at the ecosystem, mm -hmm. it's the label. So I said, yeah, I said, actually, that's where I need to be. So we came up with a project. Um, we decided, you know what? Uh, so we, we can't it's, do it's Timo and, and I. Born twice now. Yeah, Born twice. So we're going to do a Born twice album. But the entire album was going to be a collaboration. So every song was other people featuring. So we pulled in a lot of great talent. And we Is that where Million Supus came in now? That's when we did a Million Supus. So it was a cover song of the track. I got no there's like a million supus in the CBD And like a million supus that my eyes can see A million supus who would go out with me Only a few supus with the man JC A million supus in the CBD And like a million supus that my eyes can see A million supus who would go out with me Only a few supus with the man JC I was chilling for a month, three down at Ambassador No stones in my pocket, not even a mega rider I can't take the shuttle, cause that's for Bobby Lars. I feel like buying fries, but I'm too far from the past I decided to walk over to Ken Com, yeah. but I was distracted by this chick who was the bomb. Oh, I meant to feel my eyes and I was swept I see, away. Yes, it was love at first sight. I had nothing oh, to say. Being the bond right that I am, I took control of my I senses and I remembered I should flee from all Hallelujah. of my tendencies before I looked away. Yeah. I saw another chicky oh, she had a no, food with jelly and deadly sneakers from Nike. Immediately I saw her, I knew she was the one. The sparkle in her eyes was better than of the sun. I was almost hit by a car while I was crossing the road. Too many chicks walking back, couldn't handle the load. From Isich to Dandoch, yeah. Guru to Uru. Uh, Lavi to Valley, yes. to 3 to 8B, uh, they come from everywhere uh, to this Nairobi. Uh, and Lord, I'm crying out, uh, I wonder, can you save like me? Like a million supus in the CBD, and like a million supus that my eyes could see. A million supus who would go out with me, only a few supus with the man JC. A million supus in the CBD, and like a million supus that my eyes could see. A million supus who would go out with me, only a few supus. Um, then we did a song with Valar Kimani. Uh, this is way before Project Fame. I'm mm. talking 10 years mm. pre-Project Because she was in your church? Um, yes, she was, in our, she was in our church.
then we did a song uh, we do uh, John Kigada uh, featured a lot hey, um, and I uh, hear John Kigada back in the day was the was rapper, the rapper. Yeah, and we, we were his official producer <laughs> Um, at this time, I start bumping into people like Steve Ominde. Mm. Um, so now you know you're now you're starting your hobnobbing. Now we are in the elite because we are like ten producers in Nairobi. Yep, pretty much. So that's I can look at some um, unknown uh, Kalifata. No, Nini, that sound not yet. I remember going to visit Climo once, and I'm checking studio and saying, "Man, you need to <laughs> when you're when you're ready, come over." Uh, you know, now we, we, we eat our words. Eh? Uh, I remember him being in the studio with Juakali, recording in their living room with a keyboard and headphones and telling us <laughs> and as there I didn't know what I didn't know what no nini I wouldn't know what was coming up then but it was interesting Lucas coming over to ask me how do you do this how did you do that no and way. I'm telling you yeah yeah but see me had already gone the commercial route yes. so me at because those days our track was what 5,000 bob it was not worth it maximum 10,000 then you do a track for a month so it was not a business but let me say yeah. let me let me let me say the first time I ever met you so the first time I ever met you was, l I think, mid-2000. Okay. And the reason is because we had started a group called Extra Fat. Yes. Now, Extra Fat, see, us guys, we are, us guys now want to also be in this music industry thing. So it was me and three other guys. Yeah. A guy called Mikey. Me, I was a technical engineer. I was like you. I see. I was not the rapper. And Kembi was there. Yes, Gitura Kembi. And we're in the same church. That's exactly. why he came. In fact, that's how we learned. That's even why we bought a PSR 530. Because wow. we saw it. That's how, that's how the first... That's now the guitarist would play the PSR 530. No way. I would now be the guy who's doing the engineering, connecting it to a th thing, a tape. So we made and Prezo, the kind of guys would come and rap and things like this. So we made so many songs. CMB are more one and only. Yes. So we wow. made so many songs. Mikey now was our business guy. He said, guys, we need to figure out if you can make this thing work. Mm. Get 15,000, we're going to go and record. But me, I went to Hook or Rave. So they came and recorded a song with you. No way, I didn't Extra remember. fat. Yeah. So me, I came that day to pick it up. That's how I met you. I came with Mikey to pick up the song. In fact, this is the song. Hey, Earthlings, we are now taking over your radio. <laughs> Check it. K I double F up on this record. Grabbing all your mics undetected. Who would you expect it? You know my rap scripture. More anticipated than the Lewis Tyson fixture. I'm all up in your picture. Pulling on my t shirt like you want something. My lyrical warfare make you start running. And humming tunes you never thought you'd hear. When extra fat hit the streets wearing XP gear. Never fear. A mad rap kamikaze. A lyrical Nazi with all behind me. You try to avoid it, but silence is all you heard. Now my vision is blurred. You better understand every word. And listen up closely. Get back to the bottom where it's supposed to be. I'm coming through your radio, so go turn up your stereo and play it loud. Then you know what we about. Now we play. You ain't never gonna stop us. They want big B rockers. Who got rhymes like this? Dropping this like this. Join the ride on the wild because it's To all my homies in the streets, say. To all my homies making G's, say. Down with this. Join the ride on the wild because it's 
so you were a producer yeah. at that time yeah at, like like but then you see the thing is you made money because i remember us paying yeah for that yeah because i used to moonlight and at the time um i think i mentioned earlier there's a recording format so once you did a song uh before you put it on cd there's something called a digital audio tape very small tape which was mm, extremely DAT. expensive a dat tape and i remember we used to buy each tape at uh hmm, it was something along the lines of uh it was either between 700 and a thousand bob mm. fyi at the time a cd is 500 yep, and yep. empty cd <laughs> So I remember I used to buy about 700 so basically a pack of 10 was anywhere between 7 to 9000 it was a very expensive commodity then you could only use it 10 20 times mm. but it was the highest fidelity that was in the market at the time there was a technology called ADAT then they created DAT which mm. was smaller digital audio tape yeah now Peter Oye uh Michael and uh Paul Oye's brother and Peter Oye eventually was at Radio Africa so he was working at the time at KQ Mm. He was in uh, he was in cabin. Mm. So remember I know the staff because all my materials coming from England all my mm. magazines. So one day I'm reading the magazine and then I see a box of dart tapes in England is like £3.50 for a 10 pack. <laughs> so I'm saying no. But here we buy them for 6000 7000 when I'm doing the maths I'm saying I so that's like uh, that's 70 like, pounds. That's like my cookies. Yeah, that's <laughs> not profit. making sense. Yeah. So one day I gather some coins I tell Peter here yeah, go buy me this box this tape it's called DAT he saying what is it said just cut for me tell me I'll buy the next time I'm in England so I give him the money so he comes back with four boxes tells me oh I found them in a shop in fact simple just downstairs from the hotel we stay I found I brought you four you see if this is will do I said you bought me how many he said four <laughs> no, not a lot say how much do you he said ah I think um, he tells me 2000 3000 something like that Remember this a pack of for each pack is 7000. So I start selling that tapes. The, and I, my first client was uh, yes, Johari yes. Clef <laughs> because for a client when you do an ad that's how you deliver yep. the ad. Yep. Man I made money. <laughs> Cuz I was selling so for every run I used to be paid 28000. Oh because it's no. 7000 times 4. But my purchase price and Pete never used to charge me for transport because he is yeah. my, my boy. Yeah. So he goes he brings me for And then I sell them to Johari Clef. Next time he flies he says, "Do I bring you another one? Yeah, bring me more." Okay, oh, okay. Pete, sorry, I've never paid your commission. <laughs> But yeah. So I did that business for quite a while and that's how I started setting up my so I bought a computer. Oh my god, um, from the profits from, from the profits from the DAT tapes, yeah. So I bought a computer, I bought um, I set up a home studio. So remember I had the keyboard from the first yeah. job. So I had the keyboard and I bought a computer, I bought an, a sound card because I knew what I needed. So I would just buy bits and bobs bits and bobs and then I set up a studio so like I think extra fat I made the beat at home mm. I don't think I made it at the studio Yes uh, but uh, long and short the bond toy so we did that project the album and uh, it was sonically it was quite um it was quite a project I'll, I'll share it with you the tracks and um, so we used to do the beats at night record at night So when Bruce is not there or he's traveled I tell guys yo you need to come at 4 p.m. Hey, we've sent you the track we've burnt it on cd you've listened to it you come in lay the vocals quickly and Out. disappear so i used to mix it after hours at night he comes what are you working on no i'm just doing a thing like that <laughs> so i produced the entire album free incognito uh, incognito there and um <laughs> yeah then i did the track a million suppose um i think i knew dj mose we had just met i gave him the song and he was just starting out see dj mose plugged that track <laughs> So that so we did a few gigs we were never paid for any gig but it opened us to a whole world of production opportunities mm. yeah and now now we were kind of uh, known now okay now you're producers yeah. so now people now would come calling i, I remember Ambrose now coming and do digital that time they had not even started out coming here what are you doing that's when now so people now started knowing that hey okay there are guys who are doing some cutting edge uh, stuff And at um, this time you're still in the studio alone. Yeah, yeah, it's just me alone no, now. Yeah. Aaron has enjoyed uh, Not yet, not yet. In fact, Aaron, Aaron came later. Aaron, Aaron came when I was about to leave. Um oh yeah, another side story. Another person I had met earlier when I was at next level, Chris Adwa had come mm-hmm. once to do a project. I think for Peter Dera, that's when I met Chris. Then they went and did uh, they set up a new studio so Maurice Oyando 
and Mary O'Kell of McKinney School set up a studio. You see like how Riara had a studio? Yes. Same concept. So they created a studio called Red Brick. They did a few interesting projects. Hari Kimani's album was done there. Mm. Um, um, and a couple, I think Kidum started his recording work there. So there was some interesting, it's one of those people I bump into them and like, oh my God. There's another project, two projects I did at Next Level that were very interesting. There was a guy called Jackie Male who died, a reggae mm, musician. Mm. Um, I did his album. And it's the first time in my life I ever had a rhythm. So I'd never had a rhythm. So he comes to the studio, he says, I want you to make for me a beat. I make for him a nice karaga beat. Then 20 people come and record on the same song. And I'm telling him, but I have 20 beats. I mean, what's with the dullness? So and until years later. And he did a whole album of one of my readings. I don't know what ever happened to it. I did have couple produced Hold a couple on. of songs. That album. Yeah. Twenty different people came and recorded on the same song. Yeah, you know how reading yes, is. Yeah, yeah. It's like so, the way yeah. was on some Exactly. Rhythm. And all of them are separate artists. And I, I was not very fond of raga or reggae at the time, but I understood the Kapuka sound was hot. Yeah. It was emerging at the time. Um then there's a guy who came um who had a disability. Uh, he came, he used to come to the studio all the time. So I wanted to see Maurice Oyando, Maurice Oyando. So later on, this becomes Mighty King Mighty Kong. Girl. <laughs> so Maurice says, oh, he's moved by his story. He feels he has some music he can do. So he tells him, what you'll do will help you, but you'll have to be recording outside business hours. So I produced the entire Mighty King Kong album. So no that's way. a fast song, because the Dem Love Him Ladies Choice, we did it in like <laughs> seven minutes. He just came and said Ladies Choice. So me, I was trying to do, to get rid of him, because I want to do my own stuff. Yeah. Then one day I start getting calls, yo, Ladies Choice <laughs> is blowing up everywhere. <laughs> Let me tell you that album has takes that are not meant to be there. You know how you listen to the song and you're thinking, oh God, we forgot to change that. We are meant to mute that because we just pressed it. So what Chumoka. happened in Mighty King Kong, I pressed him a version of the album and told him, uh, you take this album, listen to, uh, it. listen to it, tell me. Yeah. me. I don't know what he went and did or where he took it. Duplicated. The song, the album was released and that's how that project came out. And it was the first time I had um, a project by now a third fully produced engineer. And um, um, the feedback I was hearing, mm. everyone, and Mighty King Kong, of course, his career, until yes. at least until he died, I mean, his life turned because he was an orphan. It was such a sad story. But um, that incident, and later on, when he did his second album, I was paid like proper because uh, everyone, now some Nigerian was, yes. signed him up some Nigerian label at the time, and he said me only work with Julian. I was tough toward where I was. What? In fact, I'd already stopped production at the time when he was doing his <laughs> second project. There was a studio called Wilnag Studios. That was near the Nigerian High Commission. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah. an so, of this yeah. industry. So, so, so let me ask you, what yeah. about uh, Morris's daughter, Talia? Because people oh, yes, know Talia, Talia yes. as just a single singer who sang on Hamni, Tishi, Tishi, yes. and her single projects. But you, you, you must have seen her from when she was a baby. Yes, so Talia, of course, was always there growing up, um, just a regular kid. But later, at some point when they were in high school, uh, a friend of ours called Alma so. Maurice Seando and Rafael Tuju at the time. Rafael Tuju is at KBC. Mm. He's a broadcaster. He has his own production, Ace Communication. So they work together a lot because he comes to do VOs and stuff like mm. that. So at some, so their daughters are friends. So one time they say, ah, these guys love music. So they do a project. So I remember Chris Adoa, Peter Dera, they came, we did an album that did pretty well. Actually, the group was called Talma. So it was a one-off project. Mm. But they actually did pretty well. They traveled, they toured a bit around the world. This is the world. call for events. Yeah, yeah. I remember they traveled, they did some UN gigs. Because they were like, how old were they? 13, 14. Mm. But imagine it's a proper studio-grade album. Um, then I think Alma now left. I don't know where she is. I think, I guess she's back now. Yeah. Uh, then of course now Talia went to high school. Then later suddenly now me I see her on radio. But me and you Talia from when and she was here. And why you there during, I had there's an Emmy. There's a song that won an Emmy. It is that project. It won an Emmy because they did a song on either conservation. There's a nice song they did. Then uh, they submitted it and they won an international Emmy for that track. So that, that's what I'm saying, that project was, that's it was insane. a very casual project, but yeah. But I think at the time, so those days it was a very weird time. You'd find uh, some people who were breaking out. Eh? Mm. Someone would do a simple thing and you'd never, so it was a very uh, vibrant time. Um, so me, I'm at Bruce's place. Um, I work there, work there. So I do about two years. Um, 
I remember one day you've done the Bon Toys project. You've done the Bon Toys yeah. project. So and now it's that, nice. Now that was the the like the closing chapter of you and team together. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. Then team now started doing his case south thing. Mm. He started now. We pretty much so I ventured more into the corporate scene. Mm -hmm. He kept going with his music. Yeah. Now for me I got jaded. Uh, like I said, we are being paid 5G, 10G. So what I used to do is moonlight on weekends. I would go work from studio, Steve Ominde studio, mm. um, um, other studios to do the work. Because there now, I'll be paid myself. Mm. Then I'll pay the studio. Because Bruce was not, uh, if you come to pay at Bruce's, you couldn't afford. I think our song was like 50,000, which was ridiculous. That could mm. probably be a, uh, maybe worth uh, maybe uh, probably worth five hundred thousand now. No, yeah. these days people are paying ten, fifteen thousand was top. Uh, that you know, mm. that's Ogopa level. That's Mandugu digital level. So team is doing his thing with K South and K South blows up, and team is like whoa. And then we realize team has developed his sound so sophisticated. You know, I listened to that project and I said I can't do this. I I just mm. I am not that adept. Mm. So me I dove into. I said you know what this commercial thing seems to be opening up. This is what I'm gonna do now. Um, then one day I remember we were having a chat with Timo. Remember I'm earning five Gs. Then Timo tells me, we we're just, you know, I'm having a chat. Mm. Then he makes a side comment like, eh, hey, anyway, to tapambana to na eat 10k yet. <laughs> what? I said, what do you mean? I asked him, what do you mean 10k? He said, yeah, see, that's my salary. How you much are you paid? I did not answer. I was so shocked. And I was doing more work than Timothy yeah. in terms of volume of business. Our studio was busier. Mm. In terms of as a business, we were bigger. And remember, it's just Bruce and I. Yeah. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. Of course, I was making money selling tapes. Yes. Uh, the ways yeah. I, I, I was earning. But you were like, for my... Yeah. Ah, for my so I turned, I said, do you get me? I'm quitting. I want more money. So I was upgraded to 8,000, which was too much. It was too much money. <laughs> at the time so i was so happy yeah. um then at the time um i started getting um uh it's a weakness of mine i started getting bored now it's mm. the same old every day doing an ad mm. doing a jingle doing an ad and i was saying is this it I said, mm, i'm not sure and then she was not making mega bucks and um i'm not getting closer to my studio mm. because the plan is eventually so i think at the time i feel competent i'm comfortable i've mastered the studio in fact one thing that helped me become so good at technical work was um one day i go to the office uh this at bruce's studio he had removed everything from the studio and he said he wants the studio to be cleaned when i say everything he had de-rigged the entire mm. studio so i have a pile of um cables like a meter and a half high everything sitting in boxes then he tells me julian put back the studio we have a session in the afternoon <laughs> and then he walks away yeah, I have never sweated. No. Oh. No, I've never I've never done it. I've oh. never sweated in my life. That's how I discovered manuals. <laughs> so now manuals, what's this? So I rigged, I connected. So he comes back. He presses, oh is the mic? Uh -huh, it's working. Press the keyboard, it's working. Everything was working. He said, Good. He said, now you can be an engineer now. That's the thing. Then I, at the time now, <laughs> I said, okay, I think I want to do this engineering thing. Then I went to check options for sound engineer in Kenya. Hey, it was full physics. You are an engineer. Yeah. I said, hey, me, I'm not that good in <laughs> physics and maths. So then I started hearing ideas about engineering. Same thing, you had to leave the country, which at the time I couldn't afford. It was not working. But um, after a while, I started saying, every time I create work here, we send to the radio stations. But sometimes you'd send something, it doesn't sound the same on air. Mm. So I started getting curious, what happens on radio? So I call Michael Loye. He's at Capital. I tell him, Michael, uh, me, I want to come work at Capital FM. No Remember, this way. is the station I've been listening to all my life. Everything I know about sound, it was the first place I ever had hip hop, first place I ever had a Kenyan song. So I tell him, Michael, me, I want to come work there. Said for really, yeah. So I leave it at that. No. Then one day he calls me, hey Julian, there are vacancies. Mm. 